my mic sounds nice. Check one. I said my microphone sounds nice when it is on. Check two. Welcome all you streamers out there for another episode of Beyond the Rim, hashtag BTR. And I am your host, the Dudster, Nesta Dudley, along with my guest today, a good longtime friend of mine. He is my family. He is Evans Revere, who I affectionately call the Magic Man. Magic, say hello to all the streamers out there. Hello, all the streamers out there on the uh, podcast world. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here. It's a great opportunity for us to chat and, um, you know, get informed and, you know, talk with not only family members, but people we've known for a long time. So I'm glad to be here. Today's topic, are they watching you and who are they? We're going to talk about that. Remember George Orwell's? Novel that was published in 1949, Big Brother and Big Brother Watching. Well, in this 21st century, with all the technologies and stuff and the way they watch you, Tank got nothing on George Orwell and Big Brother. But before we get into that, Magic Man, he makes his living. He takes all the bread. He's an information technology Security. So, Magic, if you can briefly let the streamers out there know what that means and what you do for a living. Well, um, information security or IT in general um, is is full of different branches in terms of information technology um, and security. What we do basically is prepare or better explain to people that are involved in different corporate entities how to protect protect themselves from potential hackers or potential security breaches out there um it is a well-known fact that as we evolve in technology there will be good guys and there'll be bad guys and for the most part the bad guys don't have real jobs the good guys go to work every day they try to fend, you know make a living for their family the bad guys will sit there and do nothing and all they do is try to find weaknesses in the good guys and through those weaknesses try to force the good guys to give them money those are called ransoms so what i do is i try to educate the good guys on how to better protect themselves so that the bad guys don't use them as a pawn so i think that's <laughs> in short word what i do so the they are the bad guys so magic let's get into how the bad guys are watching us the various ways the bad guys are watching us in this 21st century there are various ways that um the bad guys are watching us um you you also have to understand not everyone watching you is the bad guy <clears throat> some of them that are watching you are the overseers right so we would call them like you know big brother um they may be watching you for protecting your own self. But at the same time, the bad guys are also using the same tools. Um, when you think of tools, you think of like um, Home Depot, you think of, you know, a hammer, a wrench, and all those things. Those are tools. Well, whatever you use as a tool to, whatever you use as a mechanism to um, function on your day-to-day -day would be considered a tool. It could be uh, the computer keyboard, that's a tool. The, the phone that you're using to communicate with other people is a tool. So how those bad guys are using this is they're using your social media platforms as a tool to gather information on you. And those tools that they're using are things that you are willingly using every day. So whether it's social media, whether it's, um, you know, an open Wi-Fi that you're clicking on, you know, you stop in Starbucks and you just click on the wide open Wi-Fi without thinking, you are allowing them to use the tools that you are giving them access to, to gather information, steal your identity, and, um, you know, be able to uh, hurt you further in the future. Now, Magic, if I am, we'll use your, we'll use your Starbucks um example or walmart example yeah your walmart example yeah i'm in walmart and i log on to their wi-fi so are you saying that their wi-fi is not secure well how wi-fi works is, is probably what we need to better understand 
just like when you are at home, um, your local internet service provider gives you a, a, a router and that gives you a signal. You can change the name of it to whatever you want, right? Um, that's your wireless at home. So when you are in Walmart, for that example, you are using the same system. Walmart says, hey, so-and-so provider, let me get a, a modem so I can give these people free Wi-Fi. The free Wi-Fi that they're giving you, you don't know who's the, uh, on the other end of that. So because you don't know who's on the other end, you are allowing your device, whether it's your phone, your iPad, or whatever, to say, okay, I'm allowing you to connect to me. And through me, the things that I'm doing on that device, I am allowing you, because you have the, the doorway for me to get to the Internet, to vet everything that I'm doing on my device, to go through your doorway so that I can access the internet. So uh, the better way to explain it is this. It's not that they're not secure, but it is a public Wi-Fi. Public means that it's open to any other person. So a bad guy that says, oh, cool, Walmart, all right, I come in with my device. I have the tools that you guys don't have. I have tools that allow me to, what they do is called a uh, 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 scan, right? Scan? So they connect to scan? yeah scan okay yep. so they they connect to Walmart's free Wi-Fi and they're scanning that Wi-Fi to see oh what other devices exist on this Wi-Fi that's one tool that one tool finds your device right and says oh look that device is wide open for me to hack into and through that device they can scan and pick you off right or another way they could do it is they can do something that's called spoofing. So the way spoofing works is, so you are in Walmart. You think Walmart's Wi-Fi says Walmart, W-A-L-M-A-R-T, Walmart Wi-Fi, right? Right. Let's say someone creates a fake, what they call spoof, a signal. They call it Walmart, W-A-L-L-M-A-R-T, Wi-Fi. It is stronger because it's closer, emitting a higher frequency, so it comes up higher on your list of open free Wi-Fi's, right? Right. So you think it's Walmart, you click on it, boom, and you connect. Now you are connecting directly to their laptop where they say, okay, allow this person that's connecting, like a, like a fish trap, allow them to come in and feel their way around. They can go on the Wi-Fi and on the internet and all that stuff through me. So I'm the doorway that they're going through the internet. And then later on, I will cut them off once I have gathered their passwords and their bank accounts, their information. This is how they spoof by pretending to be something they're not. You connect to it, and then they start collecting your data. Now, you have to remember, a lot of times we as users, we are using their Wi-Fi. We connect to Google, we go to our email, we go to our bank account because we're buy, about to buy something and we want to check if the funds are all there or whatsoever, right? right. We, are, we are giving the confidence that the Wi-Fi we are on is somewhat secure because we are on our phone, we're just connecting to a Wi-Fi, right? But that spoof is now inside your bank app, is now accessing your bank information, passwords and all. Right. So that spoof has all that keystrokes and data on his laptop. All right. So he decides he's got enough information on you. He cuts you off. You click on a button on your device. There's no Internet. It says not connected. And you're like, oh, that's weird. OK, you go back out and it says you're not connected. You said, well, I was just connected to Wi-Fi. You go and find another Walmart. His Walmart is now disappeared. And you find the other Walmart, you click on it, you're on Walmart normal, right? But you've already given them the keys to the castle. So you? Over there. Yeah. The, the, the old <laughs> okie doke. I was just going to say, I was just going to say, you are not aware of the okie doke because the first time that you clicked on the Walmart Wi Fi signal, you clicked on the Walmart with the two L's. We all know Walmart is spelled with one L. So you clicked on the wrong one. Had you noticed that, you wouldn't have been able to get spoofed or okie doke in the first place. So you get the okie doke, you get spoofed because you clicked on the improper Walmart. You wasn't paying attention. You just saw Walmart. The, mm -hmm. the, 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 the bad guy, the bad guy would yep. take your information, cut you off, and then 
as you just said, oh, I lost my connection. You go back in, click, oh, there's Walmart, we'll reconnect again. You don't think anything of it. You probably thought that maybe you walked into a dead spot or something. And so you're not even aware that you've been spooked. You've been okie goat. You done got got. Yep. Yep. And so now he's already gathered your information. Now, he has the luxury of either taking all your cash right there and then because he has access to your account or sometimes they'll create a little trickle system where they'll take a dollar here, a dollar there, a dollar, and it'll go on because they don't want to alert your bank. Your bank is aware that you are in Walmart because most of the bank apps uses um, background um, location uh, so they know where you're located, right? So they're, they, they say, okay, you are physically in Walmart um, because it says you are here. All right, maybe you are the one using your card right now. You know, you just pulled $200. It's not a problem. It becomes a problem later on when you said to, you know, to your bank, well, I didn't do any purchases at Walmart. Yes, I was there, but I didn't do any purchase. Well, it says that you purchased at that location. $200 was moved. But sometimes, for example, there are some banks that are very alert and they'll stop your account. Um, I know Bank of America is very good at this, where even though you have a location on, on your device, on the app, and you are using the app, let's say, inside of a Walmart, if the person requesting the money is in Nigeria, Bank of America will freeze it. It won't allow it, because if you're physically here, you shouldn't be requesting the money over there. Right. So it says, hmm, that's kind of weird. So it'll stop it. And then you'll get a text from Bank of America that says, we just disabled your account because there was a request from this and that location. Is that you? Could you verify? And then they'll give you an 800 number to call. You can call the 800 number, and then you'll talk to someone from Bank of America. But sometimes what you have to be aware of is that the bad guys also are smart. They do understand that the banks have that security measure in between. And if they don't have the ability to pull that money out, they can also, because they are inside your device. So if anyone that has an iPhone or uh, an Android device, there is inside the settings an about. When you hit about, it tells you what kind of device you have, the MAC address of the device, and even your phone number if need be. The person, the bad guy, has the ability to send a text or an SMS from the Internet to your phone to say, hey, you know, if you call this number. You also have to be aware. Your bank will have alternate notification processes. So it's not only going to just send you an SMS, the application will have an alert, you'll, you'll get an email as well. So if all three of these chains confirm with each other, then you know it is accurate that you are getting the information from your actual bank, not a spoof. The bad guy is not going to be able to do all of them all at once. Those are the things that we have to be aware of when it comes to whether it's spoofing or you know connecting to public Wi-Fi. What I always suggest to people is if you have a mobile device that you can do hot spotting with, I would use that if I need to do Wi-Fi. Let's say I'm on my laptop and I need to connect to Wi-Fi, and I'm not going to use Starbucks' Wi-Fi to connect to my personal stuff. If I connect to Starbucks' Wi-Fi, first I have to make sure I'm verifying Starbucks has a homepage that takes you to their homepage after you connect to their login or Walmart. You know, once you connect to their Wi-Fi, it takes you to their homepage. That homepage will say, hey, you are at this location on this particular, um, you know, Walmart or Starbucks um, using our free Wi-Fi, right? And then from there, you can, you know, roam around. But I wouldn't access personal um banking information on public Wi-Fi. I would rather use my hotspot on my phone. So you turn your hotspot on because you're already using for your phone. Uh, you're already paying for the phone plan anyways. I would just, you know, put the hotspot on on my phone and then use my phone to connect my to my laptop to go on the Internet. That way I know the only provider um, of internet source that I'm using is whether it's AT&T, T-Mobile, Verizon are the ones that I'm using. Now, granted, would are they susceptible to hackers? Yes, but when you are creating a Wi-Fi signal from your hotspot, you're the one creating it. It's the name that you generated. It's the password you generated. No one else is able to do that. So 
it's easier for you to know that you are specifically connecting to that as opposed to the free Wi-Fi that is misspelled wrong. So those are the ways for you to protect yourself from the bad guys on in terms of free Wi-Fi. I, I know it was a very wordy. No, no, wordy, yes, but necessary and informational, damn straight. I just want to clear up something for all the streamers out there. So you had said earlier about mac addresses so if i'm a streamer i'm sitting there i don't want this i don't want the streamer to get this twisted i don't want the streamer to say oh well he's talking mac address so he's talking apple i don't have an iphone i have an android so magic can you explain to the folks what mac address is what it is i know what it is i just want you to explain what it is it's a form of identification for any um, mobile devices or any device that uses uh, TCP, IP, or that, that connects to the Internet, right? So whether it's a phone, iPad, um, they all use a MAC address. A MAC address has nothing to do with Apple. It says MAC. It's basically an identifier, and it's unique only to that device. It's an electronic device that's only unique to that device. So... Um, whether you are on an Android device or an Apple device, they all have a MAC address. Whether you are on a laptop, um, that is a PC, or a MacBook Pro, they all have a MAC address. The MAC address is like a fingerprint. It's only identifiable to that one device. And the only way for it to change is to start it from, you know, from scratch, but that's very, very technical. Um, so that's what a MAC address is. Thank you for clearing up that explanation, Magic. Another scenario. I'm sitting at home. I'm sitting on my device at home. I'm sitting on my laptop. And and, and in my case, my laptop does happen to be an Apple MacBook Pro. How can, yep. and I like to go on the internet. I like to go on social media. We all like to go on social media, internet, interwebs. How can I get God? How could the bad guys, how are the bad guys seeing me? I'm not on a... Right. I'm not on a store Wi-Fi. I'm on my own Wi-Fi, or I could be hot patched in. How can I get got by the bad guys who are smarter than I? Um, am? All right. Well, no one is smarter than you. They may know a trick that um, you weren't aware of, but we are all smart within our own confines. Um, how can you get got at home? It's simple. You have to verify the Wi-Fi that you have at home. If your Wi-Fi is open at home. Um, then the bad guys can connect through your Wi-Fi. So um, the best analogy would be if you are at home and you don't have a door on your house, right? That means it's wide open. Anybody can walk in. That's your Wi-Fi, okay? But if you have a door and you don't have a key in the door, guess what? The door is still as useless as if it didn't have a door at all. Again, your Wi-Fi without a password, that's an open Wi-Fi. That's how you can get got. People can walk in and cause you harm. If you have a door and you have a key and a lock in it, then people can't come to you. You won't get got if you have passwords on your Wi-Fi because the person has to be able to access your passwords on your Wi-Fi to, to get you. Now, are there people that pick locks? Of course there are bad guys that pick locks all, all, all over the place. Now, how do you prevent a bad guy from picking your lock, right? The same way the banks have a security vault, the Wi-Fi also has something called encryption, right? So you can go from creating a password, which is a form of encryption that could be, you know, five characters or six or seven. Uh, the default is usually nine characters, right? Um, where it's like people would call their password password, all right? The word password. Or you can create a longer character password, which is 128 encryption, 128 bit encryption, where instead of using a short word, you would use a whole passphrase. So the longer your passphrase and the passphrase that we are using could be uh, your favorite phrase in a song. It could be your favorite line in a movie. It could be a, 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 you know, a, a line in a storybook that you like when you were a child all of those but you do a combination of characters right so you would do a capital letter in there anywhere you would do a number in there anywhere you would do a symbol anywhere in there so for example for a one you could use an exclamation point right for an eight for a, a, a b you could use an eight for an uh for a three uh or an e you could use a three or an N sign. 
So all those are different um, characteristics or symbols that you could use within the phrase. Now, the way our brain as humans function is even if something is written backward, because your brain already knows what it is, it's unscrambling that backward word and you can make it out. So you write it out, you know, your past phrase, you know, um, Jesus Christ Superstar, right? And in Jesus Christ Superstar, you, you have different characters written in there. Your brain is reading Jesus Christ Superstars, even though there's multiple different characters in there that are not the right letters and alphabets. So you know what it is. So when you're typing in your password, all that, no one's going to be like, oh, you know, his favorite play is Jesus Christ Superstar. And I'm, I'm sure that's what his password is. And the length of the character. So these bad guys, they're sitting outside your house in their fancy cars, and their laptop is pinging all around to see what open Wi-Fi they find. They see your Wi-Fi, and it has a lock on it, which means it's encrypted, right? right. They click on it, and they use, you know, it says, okay, use your password. Let's say they're really out to get you, and they have little password decryptor tools, right? Well, the magic of your providers is that if the person does multiple attempts and the password is wrong, it won't allow them. But what you can also have, some of these tools um, that your internet service provider gives you, like, um, for example, I use Xfinity. There is an app that tells me everyone that tries to log on to my, to my Wi-Fi or everyone that's logged on a device on my Wi-Fi. So you log on, I have the ability to either block you, move you to a dead spot, or completely eradicate you, right? So all those are options within the tools that you use for from the internet service provider. So you inside your house, okay, and the bad guy's out there to really trying to get you. He's trying to log on to your device. Let's say he finally cracks your, your wireless. He's into your Wi-Fi. You could still, because your app gives you an alert that, hey, someone just logged on to your wireless. Like the commercial that we see on TV with the dad where um, the kid comes up through the window to go and see um, the, the, the daughter. And the dad opens the door and says, oh, you must be Steven. Because it says Steven's phone just logged on to his Wi-Fi. Right, that's Those a pretty entertaining are- commercial, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's the tool that the provider gives you. Because when the person logs on to your Wi-Fi, boom you get the alert from your from, from the internet service provider that says so-and-so just logged on to your Wi-Fi. So when the bad guy tries to walk through your door, your alarm kicks off and you know the bad guy's there. Now, the best way to protect yourself, again, to double back from those bad guys is to have a longer string of passwords and always keep like your, your Wi-Fi secure. There is also an option to hide your Wi-Fi inside the internet service provider that gives you the the, the wireless uh, modem, right? You can go in the modem to their app and not broadcast the Wi-Fi name. So when you don't broadcast the Wi-Fi name, it's a hidden Wi-Fi. So your devices will connect to it because you know it, right? You know the name of it. But the bad guy sitting outside your house that don't know you from a hole in the wall doesn't know the Wi-Fi, so he doesn't see the broadcast of the name. He can't connect to it, and you're safe. That's how you would pre- prevent yourself from being got by the bad guy. Fascinating. Fascinating. Magic, this is, I think this is the time to go into a break. So on the other side of the break, this is what we're going to talk about. This happens to me. This happens to a whole bunch of folks out there. I go on my Facebook and I see all these advertising. I go on my Facebook at my job and I see different advertising. They are watching you. They are watching you. So back on the other side of the break will be my guest, Evans Revere, who I affectionately call the Magic Man. You've probably heard that you need to be careful about what you post online. Well, here's a story that'll explain why. Once upon a time, a nice fellow named Tim uploaded a picture of himself to his favorite social network. It wasn't a bad picture, maybe a little goofy, but innocent enough. Little did Tim know that this photo would be his downfall. When Tim uploaded his photo to the internet, it was stored in a few places. One of these was the server of Tim's favorite social network, which allowed all his friends to see it. 
Another was a government server that picked up lots of information from the internet in case it could be useful down the line. And the third was the server of an identity theft crime ring. Back on the social network, a few of Tim's friends gave their approval to his picture, but most ignored it. Meanwhile, the social network made his data available to an advertising firm. They noticed the frisbee in Tim's photo and started sending him frisbee ads, hoping that he'd buy more frisbees. Unfortunately, he would not be able to because of what happened next. You see, the identity theft crime ring liked Tim's photo much more than his friends did. That's because it showed his house in the background. One of the pieces of data in the image file was the exact location where the photo was taken, allowing them to figure out Tim's address. Now, this crime ring had already collected some other information about Tim that he had unwittingly posted online, including his phone number and social security number. So they called Tim's bank, pretended to be him, and tricked the bank into resetting his password using all of the information they had. Needless to say, they transferred all of Tim's money into their own pockets. They also gained access to his email accounts and sent his friends malware that stole their bank account information. This was bad for Tim's social life. To console himself over the loss of his friends, Tim took a vacation halfway across the world and by strange coincidence chose the very same country that had intercepted his photo. Unfortunately for poor Tim, the nifty design in his shorts was also the flag of a rebel army trying to overthrow that country's government, and he was identified as a possible threat. So he was pulled aside at security and denied entry. Tim's story is pretty much a worst case scenario and is almost certainly not what's gonna happen the next time you post a picture online. But each of these things does happen to people on a daily basis, except for maybe the rebel army bit. Information that you post publicly can be stored by anyone who finds it, and your private communications might be intercepted and read by advertisers, news outlets, governments, and criminals alike. In fact, over 10 million Americans have their identities stolen each year. So try to be careful about what information you post online. Keep all of your software up to date and make secure passwords that are different for each site you visit. These problems will probably never go away unless we invent a completely secure way of communicating and sharing with each other online. Sorry, Tim. Welcome back, you streamers. I'm your host, The Deadster, Nesta Dudley, along back with my guest, Evans Revere, who I affectionately call The Magic Man, and we are going to go into how to protect yourself. You go on your Facebook or your other social media platforms, you see all these advertising, they are watching you. Magic Man, how can we prevent that? I am tired of seeing advertising on my stuff. Help me out. Well, um, currently, um, as you guys have been as you guys have been watching on a lot of the news outlets, uh, Facebook has been getting a lot of scrutiny because um, Facebook initially, as a platform, weren't being forthcoming with uh, how what they're doing with the data they're collecting from you. Um, if you a Facebooker like me that's been on there since two thousand six, I believe, you 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 will see that. You've been on there for so long that they have so much data from you, from your pictures, where you are, what kind of things that you like. Those are the data that they're collecting. So they see your tendencies, the patterns that you have. Uh, it's human nature, you know. Uh, um, we get up every day, you know, we put our shoes on, left foot first, right, uh, right foot second. And we do this repeatedly without knowing, so it becomes a second nature. So this is the same way that we approach social media, right? So because we approach social media in that way, the computer uses an algorithm that collects your patterns and figure out what are the things that you like. Um, so you like to go um, shopping for your pet food, your dog. You know, you love your dog. You post a lot of pictures of your dog. So Facebook or the algorithm that Facebook is using and the companies that are, you know, paying Facebook for advertisement for pet food and pet supplies, Facebook says, this person right there likes these kind of things, so here you go, because they know things that you like from your patterns, right? Here you go, here's some pet pet, pet uh, um, advertisement. It's all good and dandy. You click on it, sometimes it takes you to the pet store. But the bad guys also know these algorithms, because again, Facebook wasn't quite forthcoming 
and they did sell people's data to some bad guys. So some of your patterns, they sold off to some bad guys. And so the bad guys have a bunch, a boatload of everyone's data. So because they have those data, they know who you are. And so the bad guy says, okay, so-and-so like pets. He has a puppy. We need to draw him in. So you get a nice little pop-up on your, on, on your timeline. There's a puppy. You click on it. It takes you to a website that initially looks like a pet store. But that website could lead you astray. It could be just a website that you are now giving access to whether it's your Facebook page because you click on it and it, it gives you a message that says, hey, um, you want to go to this pet store, but you know our policy says you have to click accept here to go to the pet store. Of course, nobody reads those policies. Whether it is a software you're installing, you don't read it, you just say accept. Whether it is any kind of uh, legal information, nobody reads it, you just click accept. What do you do as human? You click accept. Now you've given that bad guy access to your Facebook page and they can post on your behalf. That could be very detrimental because not only are they inside your direct messaging, which is your DM, they're also posting for you, but sometimes they're not posting right there for you. They're posting on other web pages, misleading your friends. So you're not seeing what they're posting on your side. They're misleading your friends to make them believe, oh, click on this, it'll take you there. So through you, they are getting your friends, but you don't know that. It's when a friend reaches out to you and say, hey, did you send me a message with this link? And you said, no, I didn't. And then you go look on your messages and you're like, well, I did send you a message. They send you a screenshot of the message you sent them with a link in it. You're like, how did I send this message when I didn't send it? That's when you know you've been hacked. That's when you know the bad guy has gotten access to your account. So the best way to resolve that is to log in from a different device from the one you use all the time whether it's a new computer or, you know, outside, you know, of your regular routine, um, change your password. Usually your password, when you're changing it, it sends you an email. Those are two-factor authentications. Um, The reason why it's called a two-factor authentication is because your initial reset is one authentication, right? Where you're saying that you are the authentic person using the account. But Facebook and the other uh, providers want to make sure that, hey, you are who you say you are. So since when you first created the account, you created it with an email address, presuming that the bad guy doesn't have access to your email address, they will send a link to your email saying, is this really you that is changing your password? That's the second factor of authentication. So you go on another device, whether it's your laptop, you go to your email, you click on it and say, yes, it's me. Now you change your password. Now you think you're safe, or at least you, we would assume that you would be safe. So I would suggest before any of you guys leave this podcast, is to always set up two-factor authentication on all devices that you are using to log on to anything. It's a little bit of annoyance because, again, you want to click on this and you'll be fine, but you also want to set up two-factor authentication where it is using an alternate way to verify whether it is you or not. That's one way to best secure and protect yourself. So to double back, okay, on those web pages, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and all those, there are bad guys that live there, and all they do is monitor. So the bad guys on their wall at home, they have a little, uh, like the detectives have it. You know, They have a wall that has your picture on it from your social media platform and all the other social media that you use. And they're trying to figure out how to best access any of those because chances are, as a human being, the probabilities of you using the same email and the same name for all of those are very high. So if they get access to one of them, then they have access to the other ones. So what we always suggest to do is to have different passwords for each of your platforms. So if you're hacked in one platform, the other platform is not affected. So that's a way for you to keep yourself from being got on social media. Now, the question was, you know, uh, how to protect yourself and they are watching you. Yes, they are watching me because bad guys are building profiles of each and every single one of us 
out there while we are on social media. Social media is like an open forum where everybody's there and everybody's doing something. There are people that are just watching like voyeurs and there are people that are there collecting information on everybody's patterns. So those are the things that you have to be aware or concerned about. So Magic, once I am gotten by a mm-hmm. bad guy and the bad guy has all my information, can a bad guy go into my Facebook account and change my Facebook password? Lock me out of my own account. No, because the bad guy need the second factor authentication that these applications, that the government forces these applications to use, a verification method, which is your email. So when you first created the account, right, you were on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, you created the account, it has to send an email somewhere to verify that it is you that is changing the password, okay? So the bad guy don't have access to that email address, okay? Then they can't change your password and lock you out. Now, let's say, uh, hypothetically, they have gained access to your email uh, because you use the same password for both, okay? Right. So when the ba- bad guy goes to change your password, it says, go to this email. But the the websites, whether it's Facebook or uh, Twitter and all those things, they don't show you the full email address. They give you the first uh, characters and the email address, right? right? And then they blank out the rest using like asterisks and blank out the rest, okay? So if the person that hacked you can kind of figure out, oh, this is like so-and-so at Gmail, and they go to Gmail and try to use the password, and they get in, even then, you can set up authentication on Gmail for anyone that is, that is logging on as you from a device that you're not logged on to that is outside of where you're located for you to get an alert on Gmail on your side. So let's say hypothetically they do get into a Gmail that you, you had set up for this, right? They get the code to that side. They get it, and then they say, okay, yeah, it is me. All those relationships also rely on fake um, 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 spoofing IP addresses. So the bad guys don't have IP addresses that are local to you, right? They have IP addresses that are somewhere um, in the South Pacific or something like that because they have to use what they call a virtual private network, a VPN, Mm -hmm. where basically they're spoofing their IP address to pretend they are somewhere. So there are applications that allow you to do that. Uh, VPN allows you to, while you are sitting here in Massachusetts, pretend to be in South Africa. So you turn on the VPN application, and the application says, I'm blocking your local Massachusetts IP address. I'm generating an IP address from South Africa for you, where now while you are browsing the Internet, it appears as if you are in South Africa. So the application that you are using, uh, uh, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, or whatever, they use your IP address to determine your location. So they say, you are now in South Africa. Well, they know not too long ago you were just in Massachusetts, so you are now in South Africa, and you are requesting to change the password. Of course, they'll do an alert. The alert will say, hey, are you sure this is the person? And then you, on your end, Hopefully, you are aware that you got an email from Twitter, Facebook, and all those that says, hey, someone requested to change your password. Is this you? If it's not you, there's a link in there that says, if it's not you, click here. You click there, and then they block that IP address. So that's how you would basically keep yourself from getting got. Now, what I also always suggest is not only just using different passwords for these different um, applications that you are using, but setting up two-factor authentication, there are two applications. Google has an app for authentication. Microsoft also has an app for authentication. When you are logging on, um, let's say um, Facebook, okay? Facebook, you can use the Google authentication app or the Microsoft authentication app where Facebook sends a code to that app. The app says, okay, um, use these nine characters. All right, these nine numbers or these six numbers, put that on Facebook. You put that on Facebook, it means that it related the information to the 
authentication application. The application gave you a number, the number you put it in Facebook. Facebook says, okay, I have confirmed it's the same person. So these are little tools that you could use. Um, there are also ways to go into um, your Gmail account, your Facebook account, and tell them that you want to be notified every time there is a change. You want to be notified if anybody is requesting for anything. That way you prevent anyone from accessing you. So if you go into the security settings um, and your Facebook, uh, Twitter, and all those, you can be notified for practically everything. If you go into the security settings, you can also ask for them to ask you to verify any changes that you want to do. It's a little bit annoying because it kind of <laughs> slows down the process of your freely walking around and doing the things you want to do. But it's a small price to pay for security only because when the worst feeling in the world is when you come home to your house, okay, you have left your door locked, uh, the keys were were in your in your possession. You come home, your door still looks like it's locked, but you walk inside your house and everything is rearranged. Now you don't know how the person got into your house, so now you're thinking you have been violated. This is how your social media account feels. This is how it feels when uh, someone has stolen your identity, and it's the worst thing that could ever happen to you because regaining back all your identification information takes a very long process. So the best way to prevent yourself from going to hell is by preparing yourself for possible hell, which means secure yourself, which means creating long passwords. So use a passphrase with multiple characters in it, which means being aware and alert when you're clicking on things. If you get a, a, a message that says, um, and I had this conversation with a friend recently on Instagram where they get a direct message from Instagram that says, hey, uh, we noticed that you're violating our policies and um, we need you to click on this link to verify that you are who you are, right? But it says Instagramforum.com. Well, Instagram, Facebook, Apple, Twitter, uh, YouTube, they all own their domain, which means there will not be an Instagram forum.com. It's going to be Instagram.com. A forum would be a subfolder of Instagram. So it would be Instagram.forum.instagram.com or Instagram forum.instagram.com. Or it would be like, you know, um, looking for something dot facebook dot com the end of the url or the address would be the main domain the main domain so it would be facebook dot com youtube dot com google dot com even gmail has a dot com like they own those it wouldn't be the name included in another ensemble another package dot com or dot cu dot ca or any random dot it would be dot the dot com number the dot com name would be specific to the owner or the proprietary of the of the domain. Be very aware of those things because it does exist on social media that the bad guys create those spoof websites. It'll look exactly like Facebook because you can download all the page content of Facebook onto your computer and then create a fake page and upload all those contents. All right. Uh, so people are out there doing these things. The only thing is, you have to be diligent enough and pay attention. All the dot coms belong to those owners. Walmart owned their dot com. You know, Target owned their dot com. All those corporations, there would be Target dot com, not like blah, 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 Target. And then it's misspelled. Watch out for misspells. Watch out for fake spoofing that has the name, but at the end of the, the dot com, it would be like a dot CU, dot CA, or something like that. Watch out for those things because those are all. I have also seen those spoofing links where the artwork is just a little off from the original artwork. So in other yep. words, you see the Facebook logo, but the spoofing Facebook yep. logo would have a characteristic that's just a little off, whether it's the color, whether it's the font size itself. Again, that's another telltale. I tell people that when you, whenever a link comes, you don't know that link, you don't click on that link. Exactly. Exactly. Because what ends up happening is just like 
when someone tries to spoof you over the phone. You know, they say, hey, I'm from the IRS and I need you to verify your social security number. Well, the federal government only communicates through U.S. Postal Service. They're not going to call you and say, I need to verify this information. So if you get a phone call like that, you know it's a lie. The government will always send you paper. <laughs> they always send you in a mail where you have to verify. Then you can also go to your local offices for those government branches. So the same thing will apply in those URLs that you get. If it's an HTTP blah, 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 and it's like, you know, magic Instagram.com, but you, you click on it, you automatically allowing them to gain access. There are there, there, another tidbit is a lot of people fall for these things, and they think, okay, well, I just clicked on a link. I didn't know this was going to happen. There are applications that self-install by clicking on just the link. When you click on the link, you are allowing that link to install on your side the uh, spyware, like malware, on your device. And those malwares are not collecting data from you. So you just click and go. When you get to the site, you don't see anything. You exit out. Well, guess what? You've already given them access to your content. You've already given them access to your account. Those are all redirects that exist in the world of the World Wide Web. So you have to be aware that when you click on something, you are initiating giving access to something. Be aware of those things because... Um, there are a lot of bad guys out there, and their job is just to con you into giving them access to your private information. Magic, this has been very insightful. Our hour has just flown by. Thank you again for all this information, but I just want to stop right here. First of all, I want to ask you, to try to do this podcast in one hour is just not going to do this any justice so i just want to ask you can i have you back on future podcasts and we could just run this and run this down and really break it down and let the streamers know about the bad guys so can i have you on future podcast pop magic oh yeah definitely um i'm open uh whenever you guys want me to stop by i'll i'll come in and give you a little bit more details on how to better protect yourself because i think um the more secure we are as individuals, the better and stronger the link we are, and the less the bad guys will have, um, you know, of our data. Right, right now we are going to go into a little break, and then on the other side of the break, we're going to wrap this up. We're going to let you know how you can get in touch with the Magic Man, how you can get in touch with the Dudster, uh, plug a fellow podcaster's podcast. Nestor Dudley, the Magic Man, even if you're we'll be back on the other side of this break. Would you be comfortable living in a house that someone else had the key to? What if an underground tunnel led into it from a public park where its windows could never quite close all the way? Would you trust it with your safety and your privacy? The internet is that house. This is not to say never go into the house, but rather you should know the hazards before you store all of your valuables there and do what you can to protect them. So why is it insecure and why can't we just fortify it until it's safe? Well, first of all, the internet was not originally built to be what it is today. It's like someone decided to expand a shoebox into a skyscraper. The internet originally developed when computers were huge and so expensive to own that only universities, big businesses, and a few governments had them. The point, originally, was to let these massive supercomputers talk to each other. And as soon as two computers could send information back and forth, we had a network. The network gradually grew until personal computers emerged in the 1980s, and then it exploded. Soon, people were not just talking to each other, but also exchanging money, playing games, reading news, shopping, and doing everything we associate with the Internet today. Other devices started talking to the network, too. Phones and cars and refrigerators and elevators and power plants and much, much more. But the ease of all those devices talking to each other came at a price. Security. One computer could send another instructions to delete everything on it or take it over. We call these viruses and malware. Or one person could steal another's identity by guessing, cracking, or extracting a password. Vulnerabilities such as these will never completely go away because they're built into the Internet's very architecture. Criminals use them to steal billions of dollars. Governments use them for surveillance. 
and hacktivists use them to further their political goals. Between 2004 and 2013, over one billion records of personal information were stolen or leaked through data breaches of major organizations. As a thought experiment, let's imagine what a perfectly secure internet might look like. Users would not be allowed to download or install anything onto their computers. All internet traffic would be monitored and regulated by bots and humans, massively limiting the number of websites you could visit. In order to log on to a website, you'd have to type in a 100-character password, submit a genetic sample, and whistle a tune. The servers that hold data would be kept in heavily armed fortresses on the moon. And even with all these safeguards in place, some clever hacker would almost certainly still find a way in. The good news is, even with our flawed internet, there are simple things you can do to protect yourself. And there are a lot of people committed to making the internet more secure. The house that is the internet may be built on a shaky foundation, but it's been a home to innovation and an unprecedented free exchange of ideas. It's up to us to make it livable in spite of its flaws. Nesta Dudley back here with the magic man. My brother, my good friend of mine, my fan, Evans Revere, gave us a lot, a lot of information about those bad guys out there. George Orwell, big brother, had nothing on these bad guys out there. How you can get in touch with the Evans man, the magic, you can hit him up on his social media, Twitter and Instagram, at Evans Revere. And you spell that Y V. E-N-S-R-I-V-I-E-R-E. -E. Isn't that right, Magic? I got it right? That's correct. I've known you for all these That's years. I, I know you all these years. I better have gotten that right. <laughs> How else can the streamers get in touch with you, Magic? Um, well, I'm available uh, through Google, Facebook, all those. Uh, the same Evans Revere. Um, again, I also check myself, so there are certain private pages you won't find me. But um, in any of those platforms, if you um, at Evans Revere on Twitter, you'll find me. On Facebook is uh, Evans Revere. You'll find me. On Instagram, Evans Revere. You'll find me. Um, so I'm available to give anybody any insight that you need. Um, hopefully, I can help you or steer you in the right directions. Um, there are a lot of um, ways to protect yourself out there. Uh, on social media electronically, the best way to protect yourself is to be aware and alert and be careful on what you're clicking on because um, if something happens or something looks too good to be true, it probably is too good to be true. So be aware. The next time yours truly, the Dudster, is going to be out there on a podcast, the Dudster is going to be a special guest on the Make It Rain podcast by your boy D Train as we talk about the Christmas Day NBA games. Magic, you know me for a long time. You know that my personal NBA season do not start until Christmas Day. I watch I watch a few games until Christmas Day, but that's basically football season for me. And you know I like my fantasy football and stuff. So, but the D Train, the Let's Make It Rain podcast the host D-Train, and the D-Train is the second biggest LeBron James hater that I know. The biggest, oh, wow. the biggest LeBron James hater I know is my brother, the Magic Man, Evans Revere. And Magic, I I got to, I just got to get you on the Let's Make It Rain podcast because we just got to have it all out about the king that you will not recognize well, as being the king. I, I I respect his game, but you know I already know MJ. I've watched MJ, so uh, the greatest ever for me is MJ. I'm sorry, LeBron, but um, you gotta pass Kobe first. So we can talk about that in the uh, Big Ray podcast. <laughs> of course, MJ is the greatest of all time. Of course, MJ is the goat, and of course, LeBron has to pass Kobe. You and I agree on that. That's about the only thing that you and I agree on about the king. I don't even think that you agree that he should be called the king. <laughs> no, no, I, I don't agree. But 
uh, you know, th- that's just the the hype of it all. So um, when we get to the Make It Rain podcast, we'll definitely um, break down uh, my love for LeBron. <laughs> Magic man, my brother. Thank you once again for taking the time out. You're a little bit under the weather, as the streamers could tell, but you took your time out to come on this podcast. We've been trying to get this podcast off for several months. It has been completely my fault, not your fault. I went 383 days between podcasts and this is my second podcast on my return so once again magic man thank you brother i love you beyond the rim is available on apple Podcasts, spotify google play stitcher youtube or wherever you stream your podcast visit the website at btrmike.com that's btrmic.com Hashtag follow, hashtag stream, hashtag retweet, Twitter handle, at Nesta Dudley. Till next time, streamers, I just want to say, buenas noches, hooches, cooches. I came in peace. I leave with love. This is for the red, the black, and the green. Living cool, living calm, living clean. And I'm out.